You're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. I'm excited to share today's interview with you. My guest is Joy Skarka. She's a fantastic and amazing woman who has also been through a lot. You're going to hear about her experience being raped in college in her freshman year on the third day of school. And you're going to hear about her uh, use of pornography. Her, she calls it her addiction to pornography th- as part of uh, the aftermath of that. And also some of the trials that they've experienced with painful intercourse shortly after being married. But the common theme I learned through all of this is that she can turn to God for real healing and peace and also competent doctors and really good resources out there. And the more knowledge you can gain and the more information and good information and healthy education you get, the more equipped you are to overcome your difficulties in in whatever circumstances you're in. This is episode 45, and I hope you enjoy it. Joy, I am so delighted to have you on the podcast today. How are you? Thanks, Dan. I can't wait to get into this conversation. Yeah, you've got quite the story. And I've read some of your blog posts and listened to some of your other podcasts that you've been guests on. I Can you just tell me about your story and how you've overcome sexual shame and about your testimony of how God's helped you through all of that? Yes, definitely. I, I feel like God, for a lot of us, uses some of our most painful moments and stories to make it our passions and our desire to help others. And that's kind of what he did for me. So for me, as a freshman in college, I experienced date rape and I didn't understand the gospel. I was kind of stumbling through depression and just trying to understand what was going on. Um, And he really used that through crew of college ministry. I finally heard the gospel and from understanding what God's design for sexuality is, Um, through discipleship and lots of other relationships to heal me from this trauma that had happened and to begin working through this sexual shame that I had from growing up. And and then from, from that experience, from turning to pornography, because I didn't have a sex education growing up. So I had a lot of questions about what had happened to me and you know, was that sex? That wasn't like what I saw in the movies. Um, And so that led me to pornography. So I was a freshman in college. I had just gone through this trauma and I was a new believer and now I was addicted to pornography. And so all of that to say, I I went through a lot of different um, sexual issues and, and really working on what does God say about all this and how can I begin to find healing and freedom from the sexual shame that I had experienced. Gotcha. So were you, you say you were addicted to pornography. Is it because you sought it out out of curiosity or was it more of a, um, like a, it helped you emotionally? What was your reason to, why were you turning to pornography besides the educational component? And I say that in air quotes, of course. Right, right. Because it's not a good educator, (laughs) right? (laughs) Real sex looks nothing like it. Yeah. So for me, it started out of as that curiosity. But then as I discovered more and more, and it became my coping mechanism for the trauma. So when I felt lonely, when I felt pain, even when I was angry at God for why did this happen? I found myself turning to pornography. And that's when it became an addiction. Um, But at the time, I didn't know this. I didn't know that that's why I was turning to it. So it it took a while for me to figure that out. Gotcha. All right. And then what happened? Yeah, so here I am, a freshman in college and um, kind of all by myself. But the coolest thing was a friend uh, on my floor invited me to crew, which was the college ministry that I talked about where I heard the gospel. And at a women's event, a woman went first and she shared her story of how she had struggled with pornography and habitual masturbation and was addicted to both of them and how she had found freedom and healing. And that was the first time I'd ever heard a woman, let alone a Christian woman, say these words. And so afterwards, I went up to her and I said, you know, me too. That's a part of my story. I've never said this to anyone. And just the freedom that came from knowing I 
wasn't alone in this struggle. So that's kind of how I first, but my first step, and then really just meeting with her regularly, talking. We just met at Panera. We didn't know of any books that existed about these things. We just would read the Bible and talk about it. And that's how I began this journey of understanding what God really says about sexuality and what that looked like for me then as a single person. And and even now, as I'm married for four years now, what that looks like in my marriage today. So so before you met this, this woman at that crew event, did you know that you were addicted to pornography? Did you feel like, um, like this was a trap that you were in and were you trying to get out of it too? Yeah. So since I never heard anyone talk about it, just the silence of it, it only heard it talk about from men. So maybe in a sermon I would hear it be, them, a pastor talk about men. Hey men, listen up. This one's for you. Something like that. Uh-huh. I didn't know it, it was an addiction. It, it wouldn't be until later when I'm studying it in that moment, it was more of, okay, I'm definitely struggling with this. I, what it got to the point where I'm an extroverted person. I love people. I, I love parties. And I found myself leaving friend gatherings knowing, okay, I'm going to go home and look at this. And that's when I began to realize, okay, something's off. This is impacting my personality. Uh-huh. Um, and so that's when I knew, okay, I need to talk to someone about it. And then it happened that that event where I, I heard her story happen pretty soon after that. So um, gotcha. So yeah. it wasn't like you were out seeking for help and running into roadblocks because everything offered was only for men, so to speak. It was more right. like, yeah, it, uh-huh. yeah, it was more, I didn't really know. I knew there was maybe an issue, but I didn't know how big of an issue it was. And still, until I started talking to her and then later in life, as I'm in seminary studying these things, um, it's kind of when I realized how bad of an issue it was <laughs> for me in college. All right, cool. What are two two or three things you've learned about sex through porn that you realize aren't true or realistic? Yeah, such a great question. And so for me, I lead a lot of these groups for women who are struggling with pornography, and I can really see how it impacts them negatively. It impacts their marriages if they're married, because it sets up such unrealistic expectations of what sex should look like. For example, like orgasming happening at the same time, every time to Uh such an extreme level. Like that's not very realistic. Oh, that's not normal. (laughs) That's not your normal case. (laughs) (laughs) But people in my groups, Dan, are shocked by that. They're shocked. Oh, really? They expect that, huh? They 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 think that's normal. They expect it. They think it's normal because think of it as they spent years, they're being trained by pornography. So that's one example. Another example, especially for women, is body image. So they're watching women who are photoshopped, fake, edited. A lot of them, sadly, are high or drunk and have eating disorders just to, they do all this just to get through filming so many scenes all day. Uh But, But women watching that aren't thinking those things. They're just thinking, oh man, I need to look like that for my husband or um, to be able to compete with the women that I'm seeing on screen. so Or to attract really a man. I need to be that way or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Instead For of being themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's not good. <laughs> no. Any other things that were like, oh, that was totally like not realistic? Going into like your own marriage and your own experience or working with others? Yeah, I think um, sadly it's it's so abusive and there's a lot... Um, that's linked to sex trafficking. and um, But the saddest part is that women think that what they're seeing, the abuse on the screens is acceptable, that some, they're, they think that a husband will want that or ask for it and that they just have to give it. So there's a lack of consent that's going into some of these race relationships, um, which is pretty damaging. So And violent too. Right. Right. And it, it's not what, how God designed mutual sex to be in a marriage. So people are really missing out on that component of God's design. Mm-hmm. There definitely is a dark side and seems like you're educated. I say that in air quotes again, by the dark side of sex, not the light side or the beautiful side. Exactly. And, and even thinking too about how self-focused it is. So it's all about that person and their pleasure and their orgasm and not about 
the selfless act of pleasing your spouse, which is so much a part of, of the marriage bed and the covenant. And so a lot of that gets missed in as this being air quotes again, sex education. Uh -huh. it's, it's a bad education. Yeah. Gotcha. So you've brought up several times about God's design for sex and marriage. What have you learned from your own study and discussion with others of what God's design for sex is? Yeah, that's a big question, Dan. That could be a, a whole other episode. But uh -huh. uh, for me, in my healing journey, a lot of it was because of my trauma and even experiences in high school where I was just sort of giving my body away and looking for love, but not really finding it. I didn't understand that God wanted a personal relationship with me. And I didn't know that in my marriage, I would get to see a little glimpse of that covenant love that, that God has. For me, it always felt like I had to earn God's love and thus I had to earn the love of my significant other. It, it, it was never this like mutual kind of relationship. Um, or a serving relationship where I'm serving my, my spouse and he's serving me. It was always, I had to earn it through. And that's what made it so abusive for me. Um, I in love high that. The more I learn about, you know, Christianity and the way God is, I've come to learn that he's a very personal God, a very involved God, a very aware, a very passionate God and not, not someone far away in some distant corner of the universe that doesn't, care. He's very much evolved, involved and very aware of each of us. Right. And he's so personally involved in our own sex lives too. Like mm -hmm. he's there for the good and the bad. I remember when I was raped, I remember thinking in that, that morning, God, were you in this room? Were you there when that happened? Um, Cause I couldn't think about how a God who was loving could have been in that room. But what really helped me in this healing process was realizing, no, like our God is a God of just and righteousness and angry. And he was there and he was angry about what was happening. And so he's also there in our in our marriage, in our rooms during our sexual intimacy in marriage. And he cares about it. And for a lot of people, that freaks people out. Uh, they, they've never heard something like that. <laughs> right. But isn't he also the master healer? Right. I, he is. And I love that. And it, I wouldn't have found healing if it wasn't for him. That's for sure. I love that. Okay. So you're doing this as like, you want to get your doctorate in helping women overcome unwanted pornography use, which I think is so noble. So you're doing your studies and things how about how, what percentage of women are involved in pornography use today? Yeah. So it's about one third of women of one third of people on porn sites are women is, is the research we're finding. But we think that's a little um, low just from the shame and the stigma that's attached to it. Women are afraid to admit that they're struggling with it. Um, yep. So we think it could be even higher. <laughs> Can you imagine going to like, I don't know, Sunday school and someone raising their hand saying, Hey, I've, when I get depressed, I eat, I let go to food. And that's like my go-to. And then all the other women, you know, patting her on the shoulder, saying, there, there, I understand. And then another woman raises her hand, you know, I have the same problem. But for me, I like to look at naked pictures of people having sex. Right. <laughs> and, like the stigma would be so different. You're not going to have a lot of like there, there, <laughs> shoulder patting going on for that. Right. <laughs> that's so true. And I'm finding that with these women. So I interviewed over a thousand women. And then I've led a lot of groups and so many of them said in their conversation with me, this was the first time they had even said the word pornography the first time. And some of them, I mean, I interviewed women of all ages. And so it's just so sad that they felt that they didn't have that safe place to come forward and talk about it. Gotcha. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad you're a voice for good and that uh, you're helping people through that. I, you've also gone through a lot of other really wonderful uh, healing opportunities, I'll say, in your lifetime. Um, tell me about how you met your husband and and uh, and your wedding and all that. Yeah, Dan. So uh, I love my husband. He's such a, a gift to me. And so we actually met in an elevator, which is a really fun story. <laughs> That's funny. Was the elevator yeah. stuck? 
No, that would make it even better. But no, so uh, we were living in Dallas. That's where we both were going to seminary and we lived on the same apartment floor. And so we get in the elevator and it was just like a movie where I held the door open for him and he got in. Uh (laughs) And it, it became this joke actually in our apartment where we just told our friends, like, just put a chair in there and sit on the elevator and, and you'll meet somebody. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> so, you did. <laughs> uh, and we did. So it was funny, but um, for us, so we met there and we just started talking and um, I at the time was writing um, a blog separately from Authentic Intimacy where I currently work. And so I had about uh, over a hundred blog posts on there. And so before our first date, he had read every single blog post. Oh, no, he totally written. stalked you. <laughs> he did. He stalked me. So but he knew about your not... background. He knew about your rape experience yeah. in college. He knew about. <laughs> he knew my whole Whoa. story. Uh-huh. But it kind of was nice because I was thinking like, OK, this guy knows everything and he's not running away. So this uh-huh. is great. <laughs> But it was so cool because later, like months into our relationship, he t- he told me that he what made him fall in love with me was the passion that he saw in my writing to help other women. So I think that's a pretty cool story of, of God. And so now he's one of my biggest encouragers and supporters in all of this, which is really fun. So it's cool to do ministry together with him. And so now, so flash forward, um, we met, dated, um, and then we got married and uh, it was definitely a struggle for us uh, while dating, just boundaries and wanting to glorify God in our sexual relationship, dating and into marriage. And, and so it was a big deal. And, and on that wedding night, I just remember, uh, you know, I I experienced sexual pain during our first time trying to have intercourse. And I just remember crying right there on the wedding night and being like, God, what, what is this? We didn't go through all of that hard times and waiting for this, did we? And, um, and even into the honeymoon, just having a lot of problems. And, um, and so we ended up texting a few of our married friends and just asking, Hey, like, did any of you, have pain or did any of you have have issues and everyone just being like no it was great uh-huh. of course <laughs> so that makes you feel felt, even worse uh-huh right we just felt so alone we felt like we were just doing everything wrong and so that really took us into this journey of trying to understand what was up with the pain and and how to how to do this and so definitely started off the marriage interesting but um yeah, we, we've come a long way with it. So from your uh, research and experience, what percentage of women experience uh, painful intercourse, especially in the yeah, beginning? So uh, it's, it's I, I don't know the exact number, Dan, but I do know that every woman who has experienced it um, from my the women, the women that I interviewed were too ashamed to, to talk about it. Um, that was the common thread. And so mm. it's it's definitely not something that people are talking about a lot. Um, I see a common theme here. People are ashamed to talk about some some things. Right, right. They, if they did, they could get help. Mm-hmm. They don't have to live with that. Exactly. Yeah. And so for us, um, I started talking to my doctor about it, and, and that helped a lot. And there are a lot of good um resources and talking to your gynecologist and and stuff to find healing so there are resources it's just there's a lot of shame that women feel to to seek them out right i mean you'd go to the doctor if you had a painful ankle or if you were like sick like and coughing a ton and not getting better so Mm -hmm. why not go to a doctor when you're having painful intercourse when intercourse should be a normal and beautiful part of your marriage too Right, exactly. And I think the the beauty that has come out of it for us is, you know, like we were newly married and we were in this new married small group. And I remember talking to the other couples and and them talking about how their sexual intimacy was like 10 minutes. Like, that's it. And Uh I remember saying 10 minutes, like we're like an hour and a half. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they just were they jealous understand. <laughs> they just couldn't understand because all they were doing was intercourse uh-huh. and for us we had to incorporate so many other pieces of foreplay and 
just to get my body to the point where we could have intercourse. And I'm thinking, wow, like how what sad kinds is of it? things? But, I'm curious. Yeah, so just a, a lot of touch, a lot of um, um, we an exercise from a, a book called I forget the name of the book, but it's called Making Love with Your Clothes On. And uh-huh. so just a lot of like massage and and different activities just to to warm up. And my friends, um, it just sounded like they skipped all of that. And I'm like, you're missing out on so much more to sexual intimacy. And I think a lie that a lot of Christians believe is that sex is just sexual intercourse when yes. there's so much more right. to sex and sexuality. And, and so for my husband and I, I think that was the biggest blessing is we got to really uncover all of these different pieces of it. Um, you yeah. learn to enjoy the whole experience, not just intercourse. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a great blessing. Um, if someone's listening to this and they're experiencing pain, any tips you can offer them or, and, or what, what are one or two of the things that like really, I'm assuming you got over the pain and it's not as much of an issue now. What, what's like, was there like a big aha or was it, was there like a big, a a switch you had to flip in your head or what helped you kind of overcome that? Yeah, Dan. So it, it's definitely not what it was uh, in terms of extreme pain, um, but it still happened. I'd say, it, you know, it, I don't know, it's hard to tell, but different circumstances kind of make it more painful or less painful. And it's really just patience and communicating with your spouse that, oh, this isn't working. Let's try something else. Or maybe we do need to spend more time in that foreplay season section before we move on or try different things. And so for me, communicating it with him and realizing that it's an us thing, it's not my fault. It's not something I have to solve on my own, but rather we're partners in this. And so that really helped me. And there were some different books, um, Restoring the Pleasure by the Penners had some helpful activities. Um, I talked with a licensed professional sex therapist that was a game changer, really helped me unpack my trauma more, um, find healing from some of those things. So what I would encourage someone who is experiencing it is really thinking through, okay, have I gone to a doctor? Because there are some physical things that can be done. And have I worked through all of that? Um, Pelvic floor therapists are are great. I personally um, had not so great of an experience, but I have been looking into finding another one. And I've heard from my sex therapist that my experience was not the normal. So I don't want to scare anyone. Uh (laughs) But um, I hear those are really helpful. And then there's there's a lot of other books and resources out there. uh, If you just do some some research to find help and healing. Great. And I think it was episode 25 on this podcast, we interviewed a pair of uh, pelvic floor specialists there in the Dallas area. Excellent uh, oh, resource great. if you want to listen to that one. Yeah, well, I wish when I was in Dallas, I knew about them, I would have gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you find freedom from the shame that comes with painful intercourse? Like you're with your group of friends, and it seems like you're the only one experiencing the painful intercourse. And then the shame of like the pornography use, it seems like women don't talk about it. It's usually only like a man problem. How did you overcome that shame and how are you helping others that may be in that overcome the shame associated with that? Yeah. So this is my, my passion, my heartbeat, because I really think that this sexual shame is what keeps women, especially stuck in these cycles of addiction or isolation because especially we see in the Bible, we see in, in the story of Adam and Eve and Genesis, once they experience sin for the first time and they have this shame, what do they do? They hide. They hide from each other. They cover their nakedness. They hide from God. And so this sexual shame really isolates people. It keeps them from God. And so one of the biggest ways to find freedom and healing from this shame is to know God's love on such an intimate level and and realizing that God loves us even with our uh, struggles, even with our addictions, even with whatever it is that we're walking through. And so if we look back at that story in Genesis, like he didn't just leave them hiding. He called them out of hiding. 
he called them back to a relationship with him and and then he provided for them. He made them clothes and it's just such a cool story. And so that's what he does for us. And so I talked a lot with my women on how to build intimate relationships with God. And then secondly is getting into community where just like with God, you realize you're known and you're loved. And so maybe that's not someone who has been through your exact experience. Like for me, a lot of my friends hadn't gone through what I went through, but they still listened and they were safe people for me to talk to. Um, and so finding safe people is really key. And so even if it if you don't have that, say at your church, we have that online. Like you can find an online small group through Authentic Intimacy, where I work, we have different online groups where you can meet with other people walking through similar things and, and can really help you know that you can be fully known and fully loved no matter what struggle you're walking through. So that's what helped me and how I'm really encouraging other women as well. Great. And you lead one of those women's groups now. Can you tell us a little about that? I do. Yes. So I lead one specifically for women struggling with pornography. Um, And so we're hoping to get that uh, book published in the future. But we also have a variety of books. One, I love one called Sex and the Single Girl. We have a married women's group called Passion Pursuit, how to improve and work on sex in the bedroom. And so, yeah, we just offer a variety of things to really help pursue kind of merge because a lot of what we've seen, Dan, is people try and separate your spiritual life and your sexual life. And Uh we like to say, no, like they can be combined. Like God cares about our sexual life and our spiritual life. And so we like to have these conversations about it. Why is that a foreign concept to so many people? Right. People, they just don't think that their body can be both, that they can be spiritual and sexual and that God must not be, you know, concerned or care about our sexuality when he designed it, he created it. And so, yeah, it's such a foreign thing. Do you think part of the issue, it could be we compartmentalize spirituality too much? Like spirituality is, I don't know, reading the Bible and singing hymns and prayer alone, and that doesn't feel very sexual. So we find that incompatible. Where instead, maybe spirituality is more it isn't praying is spiritual per se. I mean, it can be very spiritual, but there are times when prayer isn't. Reading the Bible can be very spiritual sometimes, but you can also read a not. It's spirituality, I think, is more connecting with God. Mm, I love that. So when you expand yeah, that I... definition of spirituality as connecting with God, then you can see how spirituality and sexuality go really well together. Exactly. And how a single person is also sexual. Yes. That helps with that. (laughs) Absolutely. We don't just become sexual beings the minute you get married, which is a lie that I definitely believed. And I think Uh that really plays into a lot of sexual pain that people have as well um, from believing that all those years. So if you had a daughter and she was getting ready, you know, in her teenage years or whatever, what would you tell her then? about how she's a sexual being. Yeah, so (laughs) it's hard to think years from now, you know, picturing yourself in that shoes, but I definitely would hope starting young, like starting the conversations even younger, a great resource is called The Birds and the Bees. talks about how to have these conversations with kids because I think the more we normalize it earlier on, the easier it'll be to have those conversations. And so I really hope that we don't just have a one-time sex talk, but that it be a conversation that kind of happens um, throughout their childhood and into their young adult ages um, and just providing her with the resources of where she can go to find answers so that it's not a shameful thing. Uh, And so that she doesn't turn to uh, Google, (laughs) Uh a good friend Google, (laughs) which might lead to pornography. So, Gotcha. Make sure you have safe search turned on. (laughs) Right, right. Uh, Any last bits of wisdom or experience that you want to share? Yeah, I think um, being, well, we know that so many women are struggling with this, whether it's pornography or pain during intercourse, sexual pain. 
And so just for all of us who are listening to be a safe person, a safe person that people can come to. And, and if they do share something like this with you, just being careful on how you respond so that it doesn't create more shame. So maybe just thanking them. We can't end the episode just here. We have to talk about that just a little bit more. So let's say you're out to lunch with a really good friend and he or she tells you, Hey, I've, they, they're confiding in you. They're opening up to someone about their struggle that they have. How, how should, what's a great way to respond or what are some do's and don'ts, I guess? Yes. How can we be better? I love yeah. that. <laughs> I love getting practical. And so, yeah, some practical things, say someone just shares some sort of story with you. It's really just thanking them because that was really hard for them to say. And it could be the first time they've ever said it. So thank you for sharing that. And really being someone who listens, listens to their story and asks more questions. So often we want to solve the problem or say, oh, I understand I've experienced blank. And, and often when we say that, and we, if like, we don't really relate, we're trying to make it work. We're just really silencing them and making them not feel safe enough to share. So just asking more questions like, or saying, wow, that must've been really hard. Do you want to tell me more about that? Um, And then making sure you follow up with them. Cause sometimes when you do share something so personal and then you never hear from that person again, you think, Oh, that I never should have said that. I regret saying it. So maybe the next day, just sending them a text and saying, Hey, thanks again for sharing that. And then it's always helpful. You can, after in that text, say, hey, I know of this book or this ministry or a podcast episode where maybe this will help you and, and, and encouraging them to either listen together, be in it with them. Say, I'm, I don't know a lot about this, but I'm willing to learn and help you through it. That's really being a good friend as you walk through this. Or this app called Intimately Us might be really helpful for them too. Yes, it might be really (laughs) helpful. (laughs) And how does building a great sexual relationship with your spouse tend to like melt away shame and problems from pornography use or other things like that? Oh, I can't talk about it enough. (laughs) How important it is that you and your spouse communicate about all of this and just be a team. Like it's not my issue. And I, a lot of times, like I talk to women who um, enter into a marriage thinking they're the one with the sexual problem. And really, like we're all sexually broken and we all have issues. And just because my husband, he never struggled with pornography, um, doesn't mean that I'm the, the more broken of us. But knowing now that we're as a team, how we t- together can um, continue to fight for our intimacy and in our marriage. And so whether that's just having check-ins with one another, uh, maybe on the date nights, talking about your intimacy, talking about um, your desires and your needs together, or maybe it's talking with another married couple, whatever it is, just continuing that communication together. And, And the app really is a great resource for that as a couple. Awesome. If people want to learn more about what you do, where can they find you? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so I work for Authentic Intimacy, and you can find us at AuthenticIntimacy.com. We're passionate about reclaiming God's design for sexuality. So that's through blogs and podcast episodes and online book studies. So we have a lot of great content over there. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on.